lovely introduction uh, uh, and thank her for the invitation as well as Dr. Satipathy for the kind invite to speak to the to the audience this morning uh, on the topic of malignancy and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, again, I'm not sure where Sanjay came up with that ancient picture. I haven't looked like that for a while, but uh, you know, you'll you'll judge whether I've improved with age. Uh, just before we get on with the talk, uh, no disclosures. Uh, fortunately, as uh, as uh, my colleagues will attest, our our organization doesn't allow a lot of outside anything, so it makes for a very easy disclosure side. So thank you to them. Uh, just briefly, where I am and, and what I do here. Uh, this is a picture. The the top left picture is the is sort of I won't call it the old hospital, but the the main hospital at North Shore University Hospital. The the bottom picture, which is actually pretty close to what we're seeing under construction, is going to be a new hospital opening right next door, uh, sort of doubling the size of the facility. You know, the North North Shore University Hospital is sort of the uh, the lead hospital or one of the tertiary care hospitals in the Northwell Health System, uh, which, you know, comprises over 21 hospitals. You can see all the outpatient facilities and, and uh, bunches and bunches of residence fellows, and I should add, uh, medical students, of course. As, as Hi. Okay. Hello. Uh, the, uh, uh, and North Shore University Hospital itself is located about uh, 15 miles east of Manhattan, uh, for those who have been there, and within an easy drive uh, without traffic to the major airport, so we're right at the center of it all. Uh, so so ju just to sort of begin the talk, and you know, we're encouraged these days, I think uh, rightly so, and healthfully so, to, to sort of anchor most of our uh, presentations, not as just didactics, but in real world cases to reinforce some of the points. So uh, th this is a case we'll be bouncing back and forth through, to, excuse me, uh, throughout the throughout the, the the lecture and the conversation. This is a, a uh, middle-aged lady who was admitted to the hospital in May of 2019 with uh, severe colitis. Uh, I think the pictures are worth a thousand words. Uh, failed mesalamine, not a surprise when you look at the, the state of her colon, had failed outpatient corticosteroids, inpatient corticosteroids intravenously. Uh, and now we were at a crossroads, what to do with their therapy. Uh, and, and of course, you know, given the topic of conversation today, uh, you know, and you can ask whether this should or shouldn't have impacted our treatment decisions at that time. Uh, she had a, a history of, of treated ovarian cancer, including hysterectomy, oophorectomy, and chemotherapy. Do not have the exact stage uh, that she presented at that time. Um, but again, this was seven years in the past, and she was uh, knock on wood regarded as a cancer cure at that time. So, you know, without uh, this is not a discussion, which is such a, a a large part of what we discuss here in the office with our patients. Uh, IBD outcomes during cancer treatment and IBD management with a history of recent or past malignancy, uh, such as the case that I just presented. So. A uh, bit of a busy slide. Um, I believe I'm looking looking at my own smaller screen. The 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 graph the graphic to the left deals with Crohn's disease, and the one to the right. And basically, this this is a systematic review meta analysis of numerous population based studies uh, looking at different malignancies that seem by themselves to be associated with with IBD, variously Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Should note that as population based studies, there's no accounting. Uh, for medication use in, in either of these slides. So just bear that in mind. Uh, it is what it is. It's the 30,000 foot view uh, of malignancy and IBD. And you can see, you know, a few a few of the, the cancers I think we're all aware of that, that stand out, the, the biliary cancers, you know, being at higher risk, uh, primarily in our PSC patients, of course, uh, the risk of different uh, skin cancer slightly elevated, the lymphomas, which we're going to come back to and spend some time on. Uh, but again, there, there's a certain amount of malignancy that seems to be built into the sauce of IBD, lung cancers for the Crohn's disease patients. Um, and then, of course, though, you know, it, you know, th these are the the, the non-colon this, this slide. This slide is for non-colon cancers. You know, colon cancer uh, as as a uh, our greatest concern when taking care of these patients is still king, so to speak. Uh, it's highest with extent with ulcerative colitis, uh, more so than Crohn's, especially extensive ulcerative colitis. Uh, but we also see it in colonic Crohn's disease, again, more extensive, you know, typically greater disease activity uh, among the risk factors, in addition to 
you know, other factors, younger age of diagnosis, male sex. Uh, we talk about PSC, of course, as being the, the primary driver of the, uh, the biliary cancer risk. Of course, it's a, it's a major driver of colon cancer risk, particularly in our, uh, you know, small subset, but important subset of our UC patients. Family history of colon stands, cancer still counts. And, you know, somewhat controversial whether or not polyps, uh, pseudo, excuse me, pseudopolyps uh, impact the risk of colon cancer or if they're just something we fear because they can hide, you know, true polyps or true precancerous lesions. Uh, you know, I, again, I think there's a certain amount of redundancy, you know, built into my slides. I'll apologize for that in advance and other things as we move along. Uh, but I think, you know, it's a good it's a good frame of reference for yourself and of course as you you counsel your patients and teach your own residents fellows and talk to your colleagues to to just sort of make an easy number to remember again this is these are different population studies you know you can see a heavy western bias of course in the in the locales uh, of the patients studied uh, but but roughly speaking you know with you know and again focusing mostly here on ulcerative colitis you're seeing a, a twofold increased risk of colon cancer broadly uh, for those with ulcerative colitis so again, that's a nice, easy number to remember. Um, and, and again, this is just, a, again, some of the redundancy, you know, uh, another, you know, more updated population-based study, again, uh, showing here a, a risk of 1.7. Uh, again, and, you know, not, not just the risk is increased. I mean, that's something to, you know, of course, that we need to understand and keep in mind. And I think we're all very well aware of, particularly with our attention to surveillance uh, procedures and protocols. Um, but, but you know, it's also worth noting and something we're going to touch on and explore in a little more detail that, uh, at least in parts of the world, the risk of colorectal cancer associated with inflammatory bowel disease with ulcerative colitis, again, in particular, has been decreasing. Uh, and the cancer death rate, along with that, has also uh, been decreasing, and we're going to, you know, explore the, the why of that. It's a little hard to sort out, but really ask the questions, uh, is all the surveillance colonoscopy and the dye spraying and the time and the effort and the patient complaints, is it worth it? And, and you know, I think, you know, equally importantly is, is the treatment actually impacting uh, the risk of colorectal cancer, which again, does in some parts of the world seem to be decreasing. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the 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 figure to the right, you know, does a little more justice than you know most of my uh, just rambling on. And you could see this is a slide of mortality from colon rectal cancer. Again, I believe this is from a, a Swedish population based study. And you can see, you know, based on the 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 decade of diagnosis over the course of time, the trends for colorectal cancer death have been slowly decreasing. Uh, again, the figure to the right just sort of points out what we already know. It's less a a time trend of uh, of how are we doing as much as, you know, sort of pointing out that this risk of colorectal cancer is uh, progressive over time. So, so each decade of life with a patient with IBD, particularly the extensive UC, you're going to see this increasing, steadily increasing risk of colon cancer, albeit maybe not as severe as in the past. Uh, again, meta-analysis of population-based studies, again, uh, probably, uh, again, a picture worth a thousand words. Uh, maybe maybe not as encouraging if you're living in in copenhagen uh and you have ulcerative colitis as you can see from the figure on the left uh but but broadly speaking from both of the figures uh for crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis you know you you can see a declining risk of colon cancer over time uh again a very very busy slide i apologize i think the next one will be more representative try to match up at least for the color again you know this is from the a uh, more updated Danish cohort, uh, excuse me, Danish and Swedish cohort. Uh, and again, you know, like anything else, as the treatments change, surveillance protocol, you're going to see these regular updates. It's not the same data presented over and over. The, these are essentially different populations, you know, with each passing year and, and advances in treatment and diagnostic. But again, you can see, you know, broadly over time, they showed a nice clean uh, decrease in the, the hazards ratios for both, you know, colon cancer from 1.66 to 1.38, and, you know, equally and perhaps even more importantly, uh, declining risk of death from colon cancer. And again, I think the, the slide on the right very, very neatly shows that time trend uh, for, and again, this is a slide for colon, uh, colorectal cancer death. Uh, but again, this is paralleled by the incident slides. And again, uh, the slide to the, life, the left, again, sort of reiterating those things that we already touched upon, which is the 
the markedly increased risk of colon cancer with the PSC patients, which again, this is not a talk about surveillance protocols, but uh, we know that uh, most of those protocols, as you read, these do not necessarily apply to the PSC patients. Those are uh, patients who must undergo a colonoscopy annually from the second they're diagnosed. Uh, this is not something that we talk about beginning seven, eight, or 10 years after the diagnosis. And again, we see the increased risk associated with younger age of diagnosis, uh, as well as with more extensive disease. Uh, interestingly, and something the fellows ask about a great deal, uh, and I'm not always sure we, we follow so religiously in day-to-day -day practice, uh, the patients with uh, isolated proctitis actually don't have this increased risk of colon and cancer overall, and, and I believe most of the current surveillance protocols uh, actually define that and do not encourage these sort of more frequent uh, procedures as we do in the more extensive colitis, though, uh, again, I suspect uh, most of us in practice sort of uh, give a nod to that and still go ahead and, and survey the patients. Uh, you know, of course, you know, just to reiterate, you know, so much of the data, uh, at least the population data now is, is sort of, again, very European and Western oriented, uh, but but of course this is an this is an international problem. We're taught we you've all seen the slides at the meetings of increasing rates of IBD uh, globally. Uh, you know, sort of you know UC leading the way, and then Crohn's disease following behind. And again, not a discussion regarding the whys as much as you know really a discussion of what's going on out there and what we need to do about it. Uh, and you know, again, you know, just looking at different population rates here. Uh, you know, this is a, a recent study from 2017, and and you can see, you know, while the rates may be higher, uh, you know, compared to population in different places, United States, a uh, very high burden of disease relative to population. Uh, but but you know, in fact, other countries, of course, with larger populations and increasing rates, are are in fact, you know, uh, shouldering the the greatest burden. Uh, uh, globally of, of, of IBD care. And, you know, you can see, you know, by this study in tw uh, 27 publication, excuse me, data from 2010, that in fact, you know, India, you know, uh, in terms of number of patients suffering from ulcerative colitis may have the greatest uh, burden of, of care. So again, making, you know, all of this information important and, and translatable all over the world, um, or how often I should be doing the surveillance, you should uh, remember who that patient is you're talking to. And uh, do they look more like, again, a population patient or the referral-based patient that, that's sitting across from you? Uh, again, relatively similar data with Crohn's disease. Don't want to entirely forget about, uh, about Crohn's. Uh, interestingly, and maybe not surprisingly, uh, not reported to be a relative increased risk of rectal cancer in patients with Crohn's. Of course, we're aware this is, you know, a relative rectal sparing disease, not universally so. Uh, you know, with sticking with the bowel cancers for one second, uh, you know, maybe something we don't talk about as much because we lack any robust means of surveillance, but small bowel cancer is, is also increased uh, in our IBD populations. And, and again, interestingly so, uh, this occurs if, if you look at the numbers, not just in the Crohn's patients, but in the ulcerative colitis patients as well, which is very interesting. And you could say, is this a function of backwash ileitis? Is this a, a misdiagnosis? Or is in, in fact, is there some increased risk of small bowel cancer, even in a true ulcerative colitis patient? Again, you know, I presented more as something you should keep on your mind uh, as you're taking care of your patients, particularly, you know, those with small bowel disease identified and not responding to therapy. You want to work with your radiologist if you have some suspicion, but unfortunately, you know, fortunately, a very rare, rare malignancy, uh, unfortunately, a very, very difficult uh, to diagnose malignancy. So much of these are just made at the time of surgery for, let's say, unresponsive structuring or small bowel disease. Um, you know, diving into the, this, the, the, the observation of declining rates of, uh, of colorectal cancer, I think it's, it's reasonable to ask. And, you know, we all enjoy doing colonoscopies and we've seen uh, sort of the derivative evidence of the benefit in, in, in general populations, but is, the, is all the screening and surveillance, is it really, is it really helping anyone? Actually, a little harder to, to suss out that data, but what is out there, you know, is positive in terms of showing increased rates of, of cancer, well, excuse me, increased rates of cancer in patients uh, not surveyed. So you can see this is a collection. These are really our large uh, single center studies. You can see the one at the top, I think uh, mostly New England based, uh, certainly the lead author is at, is at, I believe at Brigham or Harvard. 
um, but some other smaller centers. Uh, again, we're not seeing population-based data uh, to address this, but cancer detection, you know, more, there, we're seeing more cancers in patients who are not being surveyed properly as compared to those who are participating in surveillance protocols. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, perhaps almost, you know, certainly more importantly, uh, observations of more patients dying of colorectal cancer if they're not participating in a surveillance protocol. So, so very important. I know, you know, various points in my career, and we probably all had the experience where you, you go, you know, months, you know, without seeing, you know, so much as a polyp in a longstanding, you know, colitis or, or Crohn's colitis patient. Uh, and then the next thing you know, there's, you know, some huge advanced polyp or an early cancer and reminding you, you know, why these patients are on the surveillance call. So uh, again, you know, the, the, the patients, you know, uh, nobody, nobody, hopefully, you know, enjoys the prep or undergoing a colonoscopy. But uh, I think, you know, that, you know, never mind the recommendations, which are pretty clear in various society guidelines, but 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 the data does point to a true benefit in those patients and worth keeping in mind. Uh, again, try to avoid highlighting particular single center uh, data, but this is, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a sort of a world renowned single center uh, engaging in surveillance. So worth, you know, showing uh, the information from St. Mark's Hospital in, in Britain, uh, over 1300 patients, 15,000 patient years. Uh, again, you know, not a huge number of colorectal uh, cancer detected, but clearly a decreasing trend to suggest, you know, benefit in terms of cancer risk. Uh, at last but not least, you know, finally, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some uh, United States data, you know, uh, no, no official, uh, you know, government-sponsored database here, uh, but the Explorers database, which I uh, have a slide defining its origin, uh, which is basically uh, a, a large data collection through IBM, uh, purchased initially, I believe, from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, the platform looking at different, uh, you know, hospitals and outpatient settings, you know, millions and millions of patients across the country uh, has also looked at this issue. And in fact, again, you know, rolling over to our next class of medication has shown a decreased risk of colorectal cancer associated with anti-TNF therapy, uh, again, without specifying here which anti-TNF uh, in the United States, this is largely infliximab, and now it's biosimilars and adalimumab. Um, but again, both for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, showing an association between the, the use of anti-TNF biologics and decreased colorectal cancer is, again, uh, Explorers platform, if you're not familiar with it, to over 360 hospitals, you know, I think, yeah, nicely over 60 million patients. Uh, I'd love to get my hands on some of this data. I'm sure there's a price there. Um, and again, you can see the nice scattergram again, uh, showing the, the effects of, of the different medications relative to colorectal cancer risk. You can see anti-TNFs there, anti-TNFs and immune modulators. Uh, shout out again to the five ASA compounds, which both in the top graphic and the bottom for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis also suggest that there may be a decreased risk of colon cancer. But again, not to bury the lead, this was a study primarily geared towards looking at the effect of TNFs. And, and when you think about it, you know, TNF patients are, are typically, you know, of course, uh, you know, those are our sicker patients if they're offered and given anti-TNF medications. Uh, if they're on it for any period of time, they're probably also responding to it. Uh, but it's interesting, again, to, to see that, you know, perhaps the, the sort of a sicker grouping of patients may in fact have a low risk of colorectal cancer. Finally, finally, back to our case. Okay, everybody's wondering what happened to the case. Uh, the case, she did well. Uh, she, uh, uh, she, she was not excited uh, to have a colectomy, which was certainly discussed with her during her hospitalization. She opted for uh, inpatient rescue and fliximab, which is our, our treatment of choice uh, here at our hospitals. And, and she did, uh, you know, a, you know, ridiculously well uh, and was very grateful for the treatment. And when I see a colon like this on somebody uh, you know, for surveillance, I say, if I didn't know you have ulcerative colitis or had ulcerative colitis, I would never have done so much as a single biopsy. That's how good it looked. Uh, so now she's on, she's on treatment. Uh, she's on infliximab. I mean, we roll over to the issue. It's okay. We, we have, you know, effective treatments in the past and, and, and in the present and in the future, seeing more and more effective therapies. Uh, are there risks to our therapies? And, and, risk, you know, specifically in terms of cancer and, and the patients themselves. And uh, I view this talk 
you know, very much as uh, informational, not just for you, but for me, uh, so that when I go into those patient rooms, uh, which I do spend most of my week doing, you know, sitting face to face with patients with IBD, uh, and when they ask the hard questions, and so many of them, uh, either through research or intuitively, uh, will ask about, okay, is this going to give me cancer? Well, they want to know how long they're going to be on the medication. Uh, they they ask, you know, what the side effects are, but they, you know, they really want, and most of them you know, we'll just flat out ask, you know, am I going to get cancer from this medicine? Um, no guarantee, of course, you're going to get cancer from anything. But if you're being honest with them, uh, thiopurines, which are still a mainstay of therapy worldwide, I think, again, this is this is updated information, but something we've known really in clinical practice for a long time, uh, that there is an increased risk specifically of lymphoma in patients, you know, treated with thiopurines for, for IBD. Again, um, you know, a little less so if you see in the population versus the, the referral center studies. Again, this may be a, a measure of disease activity, uh, but nonetheless, you know, if you're being honest with your patients, you have to say, yes, there is this small increased risk of lymphoma. Um, again, these are slides just illustrating, you know, some of the uh, the different studies, the population uh, based and the po and just, just as a, well, not as a closing point, but just to reiterate, and what I say to any patient who's on any medicine, you know, whether or not there is a defined risk of cancer or not, it is always the point you'll only stay on a medication for any length of time if we can demonstrate an actual benefit. Meaning, and I say to them, you, you've got to be able to look in the mirror and look at yourself and say, yes, you know, I'm a little scared of this medicine in some ways, but but I'm glad I'm on it. I'm, I'm getting what I need out of it. Uh, conversely, if you're not getting what you need out of the medication, uh, you know, you, you should be stopping it. Uh, particularly with these immune medications. I mean, we could talk about whether whether you can sort of, you know, prance along on a 5-ASA long-term uh, just with some hypothetical or, you know, benefit perhaps in terms of cancer uh, prevention, uh, but we're certainly not keeping people on immune, you know, modifying, immune suppressing, biologic, pick your term, uh, you know, unless we can unless everybody in the room can be sure, yes, this is in fact working. Uh, and this slide very neatly sort of illustrates, you know, the, the positive side, if you could say that, at least in terms of the thiopurine and specifically lymphoma risk, is that this is a risk incurred with active treatment. And this has been, you know, well-studied, different, different population-based uh, cohorts that, you know, again, maybe not instantaneously upon stopping the thiopurine, but, but once you're off the drug, uh, essentially that lymphoma risk uh, decreases back to that of the of the general population, and and you know as you talk to your patients about this, uh, you know you, you you should know and acknowledge that there is a background risk in the general population for lymphoma. Everybody, uh, me speaking, and those of you listening, we're all at risk for lymphoma. You know how do you you know how do you get across the the sort of absolute uh, versus relative risk. Um, you know, to a patient who may not have that kind of statistical background, uh, if any of us do, uh, again, because you could hear, oh, it's doubles, triples, quadruples my risk of lymphoma. That doesn't sound good. And then, you know, perhaps, you know, I, I put it in my top 10 of, of helpful slides in IBD over, over my career, at least. We, we see this, you know, I think uh, famous cartoon or pictogram from, from Dr. Siegel. He's the current chief up at Dartmouth, basically sort of illustrating what that risk really is when you're on a a thiopurine, and you can see those those little yellow or or uh, over highlighted yellow people. That that's your risk for lymphoma versus you know the rest of the population there. Uh, so so again, sort of emphasizing that the numbers are small, and you can say, okay, in this picture, you know, we have you know seven or eight people in yellow highlights. Uh, if they weren't on, uh, if, if if everybody in this picture wasn't on a thiopurine, maybe it's just one or two patients highlighted. But again. Uh, you know, in the annals of a picture is worth a thousand words. This may be helpful to you if you're not already using it in terms of explaining to patients, okay, there is a relative risk, but the absolute risk is still really, really tiny. Uh, though, of course, people play the lottery. Everybody thinks they're going to win. So uh, you need a receptive patient to, to listen to that. Uh, again, before we toggle away from thiopurines, it's not all lymphoma uh, with thiopurines and, and maybe, maybe even more important uh, because the risk seems to... Uh, uh, last lifelong, and you know, we talked about the risk of lymphoma receding um, when you stop the thiopurines. It, it's believed, you know, maybe not so well studied, but believed that the risk of non-melanoma, non excuse me, skin cancers uh, is lifelong after thiopurine use. Um, so again, you know, if you get a patient in your office, and, and I'm not seeing a, a lot myself on current thiopurine use, I have maybe a handful 
uh, of those who are using thiopurines primarily for maintenance. Uh, but I have loads of patients, uh, you know, both adults and those transitioning from peds uh, who have a, a history of thiopurine use. So you got to remember uh, these annual skin exams for these patients. And of course, uh, you know, cervical cancer risk, prob probably mostly viral associated with the thiopurine. Uh, but again, you should, this is a patient who should be going for regular pap smears. Generally, of course, uh, but but particularly so if they, there is any active or prior use of thiopurine. Um, trying to pick up the pace here. Uh, Anti-TNFs, again, mostly infliximab, I think, as we go slide to slide. Uh, recent population study from Denmark, uh, sort of encouraging, not showing an increased risk of, of uh, lymphoma associated with TNFs. Uh, but then, you know, if Maybe we're just sort of picking and choosing our study, but I always, would always encourage you to pick the, the gloomier study to, to, to inform your care. Uh, this is one, this was actually an inception cohort comparing uh, thiopurine monotherapy patients to TNF monotherapy patients to non-exposed patients. Uh, and in fact, you know, and I think sort of a, a moment of pause to those of us who are saying, oh, well, I don't use the thiopurines anymore. I don't have to worry about that that lymphoma risk, I don't have to talk to my patients about it anymore. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, you could, you, you should know that that's not the case that, you know, perhaps, you know, maybe still our, our most popular uh, sort of class of uh, induction and maintenance medication, you know, appears to carry that same lymphoma risk. So again, that little pictogram I showed a couple of slides back, even if you're not using any thiopurine any longer, you, you're going to have to you know, still be ready to roll it out or at least explain it because if you're using TNF and uh, anti-TNF medications, uh, it, it appears to be the same risk. And of course, we see this, uh, you know, well acknowledged uh, sort of uh, further increased risk associated with combination therapy, thiopurine and anti-TNF, um, not seeing a lot of that in day-to-day -day practice anymore. I hear people talking about it at the meetings, uh, but I don't know that I have anybody currently in my practice on that particular combination. Um, just very quickly, newer biologics and small molecules, gonna just check off the list and, and you know what we know about cancer risk in these. Um, As you go to the lectures, you're going to be hearing more and more about this medication. And I think you're also going to be hearing more and more, uh, not just about the effectiveness, but they're going to talk about you know, the risks of the medications and trying to sort of, uh, I don't want to say modify that risk, but but contextualize the risk, you know, particularly of cancers, you know, uh, you know, given the signal in some of the clinical trials, and this is actually, and I have to point out, this is a rheumatoid arthritis population, uh, not, not an IBD population. This is the oral surveillance data um, published recently in the New England Journal. Um, again, looking at rheumatoid arthritis patients, looking at uh, the, excuse me for using the trade name, the Zeljabs, uh, the, the tofacitinib. So this is not UPA or Invoke, though Though I think package insert to package insert, you're seeing these, the, the sort of at least the, the belief that this uh, data is, is valid across disease indications and, and uh, different drugs within the class. Uh, this was a, this was an observational study matching looking at uh, Zelgens, excuse me, tofacitinib at at the five and the ten milligram doses as compared to TNF uh, inhibitors. So everybody was on some treatment here, and again, this was primarily geared towards looking at uh, issues of cardiovascular risk, and you know, patients had multiple risk factors. Uh, so again, maybe not exactly the patient population we're seeing in the office, but but you know, should be noted that uh, aside from a increased signal of cardiovascular events, which we're not going to talk about here today, uh, there, there was an increased uh, risk of, of malignancy in patients on the, on the, uh, the tofacitinib, uh, you know, including lymphoma um, and including, you know, lung cancer. Uh, so best thing, so, so again, there's the lymphoma risk rearing its, its, I won't say its ugly head, but rearing its head again. Uh, and in fact, a, a, maybe a new risk or we're seeing an increased risk of lung cancer. These are some of the more specific numbers. So you're seeing still 
relatively small numbers, but but an increased risk in, in both of the tofacidinab dosing regimens. I should add as an aside, and I don't have a slide or the supplementary data to show on this, but uh, I know I was uh, in the audience at a recent meeting, uh, and somebody who had uh, looked at this a little more carefully said, uh, just on the positive side, well, you know, we're seeing that lung cancer risk, but this is primarily an active and prior smoker. So that you know, sorting out those patients, uh, again, that they were not observing an increased risk of of, uh, of lung cancer in those who hadn't smoked. Again, you, you know, that's, that's of course, uh, encouraging and reassuring. Uh, but again, of course, this study was not, not powered really to detect these things. So, you know, something to look out for again in the future. Um, what about our patient again? She did great. She, she had her tr treatment. She's still on treatment. Um, you know, does her does her prior cancer, you know, uh, should, should, should we have given her any immune medication? Should we have said seven years ago you had cancer? Whatever the stage was, it was bad enough you need chemotherapy. Uh, this is just, you know, a prohibitive risk uh, to give you to give you an immune suppressing, modifying biologic medication. Uh, you know, so far, <laughs> excuse me, uh, and, and the data is very far from perfect and, and is still accumulating and no doubt will continue to accumulate. So far, the data is fairly encouraging uh, in, in terms of the, the 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 risk or the lack of increased risk of those with prior cancers treated with uh, immune medications. This is a uh, uh, meta analysis of over thirty one studies, including seventeen uh, with IBD patients, and they did not show any increased risk of col uh, excuse me, I keep saying colon cancer uh, of uh, new primary or recurrent cancers in the patients with a cancer history who were treated with immune suppression versus not. Again, you can see the no immune suppression on the left, uh, number of uh, per 100, uh, excuse me, per 1,000 person years. You can maybe look across the bars and say, okay, is there a little trend there developing in the combination uh, patients? You know, maybe so. Uh, but but again, you know, the, you know, I would say at least based on the retrospective data, uh, more to accumulate, jury's still out, but but so far, not an absolute stop uh, by any means on treating a patient if you'd like to. I uh, should also add that there is, and this is sort of a shout out to our, our own organization and, and, and sort of sister hospitals here in, around the New York City area. We're part of a registry, uh, you know, looking at this prospectively. It's been sort of hard going in terms of recruitment, but uh, basically ourselves and and New York University and Mount Sinai and some of the other centers, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, looking at patients with prior history of cancer uh, and seeing, again, treatment or no treatment, whether there is any increased signal of, of either recurrent cancer or new primary uh, relative to the, the use of, of immune, uh, immune modifying uh, suppressing medications. Again, initially the goal was to uh, enroll patients with a history of cancer within five years. We extended this to 10 years uh, due to slow recruitment. Uh, you can see a lot of non-melanoma skin cancers. So, uh, uh, you know, skin cancer is the most common cancer in the world. So uh, it is what it is. I think we're all, of course, uh, at the heart of it, more interested in what's the risk in terms of solid organ cancers, lymphomas and the like. Um, again, this is this is not this is no longer the most updated data. The most updated data is being prepped uh, as we speak for for journal submission. Uh, we could see at least to this point in time, uh, no no statistically significant increased risk. Uh, but but for those who want to nitpick, you know, and I'm looking at these slides the same way you are. It's like wow, all the uh, relative risks are, are towards more cancers. You know, even if the stats haven't lined up yet, maybe maybe these folks just need more recruitment, and that may be so. Uh, and that's uh, this is an interim analysis, and this is why we continue to recruit patients because we we are just like you. We 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 know what we would like the answer to be, but but I always say you know you collect the data and let the data tell you the story of where the risk lies. So again, so you know she accepted the risk. She's very happy with her her her, her outcome and and how she's feeling on treatment. Uh, but of course, you know. Uh, like any other patient, you know, she's not just the colon, you know, as proud as we are, she's continuing to go for her, her routine, her routine checkups. Uh, and in fact, you know, particularly with her ovarian cancer risk, certainly not missing her mammograms. And in fact, uh, this is now about three years after she started the infliximab, she did develop a, a lesion uh, on, on, a, on a mammography. She had it biopsied and it was, you know, suspicious for malignancy. Uh, so now what do we do with this patient? You know, now she's now she's got cancer. 
um, you know, forgetting for a second, you know, or well, it really ties into the question, what do we do with her infliximab now that she has an active cancer? You know, what do we do with her? Uh, uh, you know, it's It sort of depends very strongly on the kind of treatment that's planned for a cancer. You know, specifically, there is some, again, retrospective, but good data out there, uh, you know, showing that for patients on uh, uh, systemic chemotherapy, uh, not that, you know, shouldn't be looking at it as a holiday from from biologic therapy, it's not a holiday from anything to be on chemotherapy, uh, but that patients on, on chemo, their IBD tends to be well controlled, at least while they're on the chemo. So, you know, that, that question of what to do with the infliximab is kicked down the road a little bit uh, because of the time on the chemotherapy. Conversely, uh, hormonal therapy, and in this study, and the next one I'm going to show you, this is a much easier slide to look at, by the way, uh, we're dealing with a lot of breast and prostate cancer patients here. Uh, in fact, there's some, uh, you know, some some suggestion that hormone therapy, uh, uh, for reasons you know uh, as yet unknown, may in fact uh, you know make one more prone to a flare of their their IBD. So chemo, you get a break, uh, which sort of intuitively makes you know some sense at least, since we we all use have viewed and still view chemo as a true immune suppressing event. Uh, hormonal therapy, not so, and in fact maybe increasing the risk. And again, just more patients, busier slides. Same first author, by the way, a colleague of ours locally. Uh, and again, but basically showing the same thing that, you know, chemo gives you a break, uh, hormone therapy, not really so much. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, and that for years, that, that was the, the case for, for cancer treatment. It was either chemo or hormone or surgery or radiation. Now, uh, again, you know, I apologize. I don't have a, a list of the various checkpoint inhibitors, but this is a novel class of cancer treatments. I'm sure, sure most, if not all of you, have had some experience with it. Uh, perhaps, uh, and, and it's basically a, uh, uh, a uh, class of medication that blocks cytotoxic T cell program cell death. I can read the slides, so can you. I, I tried to look for a graphic that I could understand and explain, and I couldn't. Uh, but basically, as near as you could tell by reading about the checkpoint inhibitors, it's like they, you know, the uh, they they finally figured out a way how to invent or or cause IBD uh, because, in fact, you know, the checkpoint colitis that we see. Uh, the diarrhea colitis risk up to 13% in some ways other than the the use of medication almost uh, indistinguishable from from IBD albeit you know favoring the the colon you know rather than the small bowel uh, but but essentially they created a drug class not only very effective uh, against cancers but also it's almost like a bottle of IBD just waiting to go and in fact you know never mind the the risk of colitis in, in a uh, patient de novo without a prior IBD history, but the risk of IBD relapse is actually exquisitely high uh, in patients, you know, who who take checkpoint inhibitors and have had IBD in the past. Uh, again, you know, how do you deal with these patients? Uh, again, it's 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 sort of a throwaway recommendation, you know, uh, you know, in terms of uh, negotiating the treatments, you know, with with the oncologist and and weighing the risks and the benefits, you know, it, it's. I think you know we all know you're you're going you're going to to treat or tend to treat the the more severe the more life threatening entity you know as the primary driver of treatment and and do the best you can with whatever is secondary in this case and most of the cases going to be IBD so just just putting a, a finishing touch on this patient uh, not only did she have a a new you know breast nodule or breast cancer uh, but again the she, she was, in, in fact, much worse shape than that. Uh, she had uh, pelvic wash, which was positive for adenocarcinoma. And at least to the histopathologist, this appeared to be a recurrence of her prior cancer. So, in fact, this was not a new primary. This was, in fact, you know, how many years after? I said it was 2012. So this is 2022. This is a good 10 years later. Uh, she actually had a recurrence of her primary cancer. Uh, did we did we make a mistake treating her colitis? Should we have uh, just offered her colectomy on the spot? Uh, she never has said or or felt that that should be the case. Uh, but but again, the reason we 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 look at this data and we present these cases and discuss this issue is that you know the the and we we don't know all the answers. We're only here to to talk about and try and arrive at the best decisions for our patients. Um, so again, in summary, colon cancer is still number one risk. Uh, when you're talking to the patients and they do, and understandably not critiquing, get a little fixated on uh, the, the risk of 
uh, other cancers associated with the medication treatment. You need to know the numbers. They need to know that their greatest risk of cancer and cancer death is still colon cancer. Uh, something we're doing is working out there, the surveillance, the drugs, maybe something lifestyle-wise that's changing for our patients that we're not as good measuring, but something's working. We're seeing decreasing rates of colon cancer and death from colon cancer, which is which is terrific. Uh, risk of cancer with IBD therapies. Uh, again, some of the newer therapies, you know, we would say not so much. That's why, you know, patients... Uh, uh, and some prescribers are afraid of some of the new biologics. In some way, they're they're the cleanest medicines we've had, and I've heard others use that phrase "clean" uh, often. But but again, you know, perhaps some of our even our most effective therapies, and we've seen in terms of the JAK inhibitors. Uh, as much as I can't wait to give them to some patients because I'm so desperate to see them feel better, you, you have to understand that there are risks with these medications, and uh, and, and you know, with each class and each year and each new drug. Uh, we have to revisit these questions. Uh, again, unknown evolving risk, as we said, with the new therapies. Uh, so far, treating uh, IBD uh, in those with a prior history of cancer appears safe so far. Uh, but again, the data is still accumulating. Uh, you know, For us locally, we're not the only group doing this. There's a large prospective uh, trial currently underway in Europe, as I'm reminded of frequently. Uh, and, and we'll see how the individual, you know, each each site and maybe combined data sort of uh, provides further information on this important issue. Uh, and in terms of somebody with active cancer, uh, this is a, just really, you know, maybe the greatest of the unknowns. And, and again, you, you will have to decide in concert with the patient uh, and the oncologist, you know, the, the stage of the cancer, the risk of the cancer to the patient, and, and which, wh which of the diseases is going, is going to take primacy in terms of therapy. Um, and with that, I'm willing to take and happy to take any unthreatening questions. Thank you very much.